Hey folks, on today's show we want to give a big shout out and sort of recognition to a good friend of the show, uh, the folks at Evident IO. Uh, we know a lot of you are trying to figure out how to, to migrate to the cloud, how to leverage public cloud services like AWS and others. Um, Security is a big deal. How do I deal with it? It's complicated sometimes. The pace in which attacks might come up or other bad things come up is 10 times, 100 times faster than it ever was in the past. You need folks that are way smarter than you at security and do all this stuff in an automated way and bring their smarts to your environment. So if you're doing uh, cloud environments, if, especially if you're in AWS, go check out the guys at Evident.io, evident.io uh, on the web. Uh, great team, super smart, totally built for DevOps in these very fast-moving environments that need rock-solid security. Go check them out, evident.io. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to another Cloudcast here coming from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, a little bit of a massive windstorm around us, so if a tree falls on us, you'll know ahead of time. Uh, maybe a little bit of background noise. Aaron, how are you, man? Uh, Where are you at? Well, so I, I'm I'm out in Colorado, and that's not what I want to hear as I'm flying home today, man. That's right. Um. <laughs> Assume the crash position. <laughs> Right, exactly. So this this could be an interesting flight today then. All right, cool, good, I'm in. So a um, couple things real quick. Um, uh, folks, continue to make uh, donations to Krispy Kreme. Thank you very, very much. Um, we're we're starting to, to track better, um, but thank you again for that. A um, couple quick things before we jump into our guest. Uh, we talked about doing a uh, project of the week, and uh, you know people submit projects, people tell us about projects. I um, want to highlight a couple of them. Um, I'm going to sort of do them in three categories. Um, so one is a uh, friend of the show, Jason Edelman, has a new sort of project group get-together that he's doing around uh, SDN stuff. So check out his Twitter feed at jedelman8. Um, guy that I work with, a guy named Clint Kitson, who uh, just released a piece of open source software that he's calling Vagrant Spice. He basically uh, did some integration on top of Vagrant uh, across about a dozen, a half a dozen or so of the public clouds, sort of normalized all of them. So you want to deploy resources across any of those clouds, DigitalOcean, Rackspace, AWS, Google, Azure, um, you don't have to think about the underlying nuances of how they do what they do. So um, I'll, we'll stick the, the GitHub piece for that. And then the last one I thought was sort of interesting, um, the Google guys uh, put uh, basically a GitHub, uh, or I'm sorry, not GitHub, uh, Docker Hub uh, as, a, as a service that they offer now. So um, folks have some options as far as where they want to run and, and store their Docker images and so forth. So. Um, and like we said, anybody who wants to submit a project to us that they want some visibility for, uh, just send them to show at thecloudcast.net. So let's uh, let's jump into the show. We've 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 wanted to have uh, uh, John Willis on for a long time. We've we've had some scheduling issues in the past, but uh, John, welcome to the show. Yeah, I was think, starting to think you guys didn't like me. No, 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 no. <laughs> we've tried and tried I, and I, yeah. I think we screwed up, up last time. No, it's uh, it's yeah. We find uh, we we've got lots of people we want to have on the show, and we always find ways to screw up the scheduling for it. So <laughs> glad we could finally make it work. Um, so uh, let's let's get started. You we you know we've known you for a while now. You were doing uh, stuff, cool stuff with Instratus. Uh, you know you've got a long history of doing DevOps stuff and Chef. Tell us about your new company and 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 this cool thing that you're doing with Socket Plane. Yeah, let me give a, you know, I, I did, um, the, you know, Gene Kim, we ran the DevOps Enterprise Summit um, back in, I think, November uh, last year. And it was, you know, sp focused on enterprises. And, and uh, I did this uh, DevOps blind spots presentation. And I thought, you know what, there, you know, it'd be interesting to kind of go back and try to f tell people about my career. In fact, if you look at my LinkedIn, like a lot of times people will talk to me about, you know, they look at my LinkedIn and say, "It doesn't seem like you existed before uh, 2005." <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, it just be too hard to explain, you know." And uh, so I actually went back and I explained that, you know, that's just, I, I'm actually spanning four decades of this crap. Um, um, and you know, I've done, you know, I've done mainframe assembler, IBM mainframe assembler when I was basically a kid, and then, you know, I did this Tivoli stuff for many years, and then I started an open source, you know. Kind of, I, I started to do alternatives to proprietary configuration management, and 
and fell into things like Nagios and then eventually Puppet and eventually Chef and spent a lot of time there. Doing, and I think where we met was as the cloud came in, um, you know, that's when I started getting, you know, it was a natural fit for an infrastructure ops guy like me and giving a really short dose for anybody who just doesn't know who I am out there. And, and then um, that led me into, I worked at Ops Code and that was fun. I was very early in at Ops Code and got involved in the DevOps movement and then uh, in the Stratius to cloud management. And that, that Stratius was a cloud manager, if you will, was sold to Dell. And so, <laughs> long story to the point, um, basically, I was kind of looking for things to do. I was at Dell and, you know, and Dell's an interesting company, but I'm just not made for, for you know, I've been basically independent for 30 years. Um, and uh, so I ran into this guy on, a, I do this, th this uh, thing every summer. I go to Vail for an organization called Pacific Crest. And on a van ride, there's this young kid and he's typing away. Um, you know, we're taking a van ride from Denver Airport to Vail. And, uh, and he's one of the, 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 the industry leaders that are coming down to talk to analysts and stuff. And I noticed he's got IntelliJ up. He's running Maven. He's doing, but you know, he's a software guy, right? So he gets a break, and, and I say, hey, you, what do you do? You software developer? He goes, no, I'm a network guy. I'm like, really? Uh, tell me more. And then, like, about a good hour and a half of the ride, he was baptizing me on what's going on in the network, SDN. You know, he, he referred to this gentleman called God five times, so I didn't remember the name until, you know, three or four months later, uh, Martin Casado. Yep. The founder of Nasir, yeah. Um, and, you know, he'd say God, and then he'd say Martin Casado. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll remember that, I guess, later. And and I was like, oh, my God. And then I was like, okay, this is really interesting because I it felt like I spent the last 10 years solving a compute problem, right? Yep. And thinking, oh, my God, you know, I've, I've just solved one leg of the stool, you know, working, being an evangelist. And so we, we, we created this friendship, and he wound up going to Red Hat. He, he actually worked at the University of Kentucky. Oh, Brent. Yeah, Brent. Brent Salisbury. Sorry, yeah, for people who do know him, Network Static. He, he basically, uh, you know, when I had met him, he had basically been running OpenFlow in production for three years. In fact, at the analyst get up, everybody was like, there's this young kid. He's unbelievable. Works for University of Kentucky. He's got more field experience with OpenFlow than anybody. I'm like, oh. Shit, I met that guy, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and we became friends and we just started thinking about ideas and stuff like that. And literally about five months ago, maybe four months, um, a little, little uh, less than five, a little more than four, um, you know, he, he wound up going up over to a Red Hat and he was on the CTO team working on Open Daylight with uh, Madhu uh, Vingopal and uh, Dave Tucker. And they were like the workhorses of open daylight. And we just kind of started brainstorming. And we started talking about, um, you know, just what are the things about SDN that have really worked well? And what are the things that kind of haven't worked well? What were the things that SDN hasn't fulfilled its promises? Um, you know, and like anything, right, these, these things come out of like, oh, my God, they're going to solve everything. And, and sometimes they solve half the problem. Very rarely they solve all the problems, right? Yep. And we started talking about it, and uh, and and of course, you, I don't think you can get around any technical discussion these days without saying the word Docker. Um, and I had been a fan, like most of us, from right from real early on. In fact, I got early access to the original repository before they even announced Docker when it was still .NET Cloud. So I I was sold on it, you know, 24 months ago. Um, and um, and they had been sold on Docker because they've been using they had trans, did all their kind of QA and and uh, continuous integration you know stuff with Docker containers, right? Yep. And so it was like we were like and I'm like well, could we take it was kind of a brainstorm could we take the best parts of what has happened in SDN over the last few years and figure out how to do and and you know and quite frankly native docker uh, networking is you know is is uh, is nascent right it's just you know it's just not designed for scale it's great for developers to pick it up run it do something so we started hacking on the idea and literally four months ago um we started a company and and you know as you can imagine anything around docker but put docker and sdn together with a team that actually is credible you know a lot of people laughed at us like oh docker sdn why didn't you why didn't you throw in IoT just to add another buzzword? <laughs> and and you know, and it was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take that, right? Like, but but at the end of the day, what we really have done in our mission is to take Open vSwitch, which we believe is some of the really, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, Madhu, uh, my partner, he says, you know, it, OpenV Switch is the phoenix out of the ashes of SDN. Um, you know, and and, um, and 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 we believe that we think OpenV Switch is is spot on as a virtual, you know, virtual switching technology. You know, it's all open source and. And it, it is being used by, you know, real monster cloud titans. And, you know, and it, it really is the uh, hidden gem of networking. So we basically took that and we've tightly coupled or natively coupled that with Docker. And so, uh, you know, that's that's our off to the races. And and then, um, you know, and then to, you know, to, to basically not only so, okay, it's native open vSwitch integration with uh, Docker, which is, you know, if you understand the, the concept of those two married, you, you know, like if you're a network person, um, you know, if we're play, playing around with, um, you know, open, uh, you know, open, open stack or cloud stack, I mean, I think you get it. Um, but, but more importantly, some of the work that these guys did on open daylight, you know, which is the open source SDN. Um, of basically what was something called micro segmentation that that uh, VMware calls micro segmentation, and that is um, and, and I'm, let me step back just for a second for people who are totally confused about SDN. A pragmatic definition of SDN is that prior to SDN, most devices would have a control plane and data plane on the device. Control plane is the brains; it's the distributed logic of how things get routed. Right. It's, it's how it's how every Cisco box has run for the last. 25 right. years. Yep. And 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 you and and basically pre SDN you relied almost exclusively, probably exclusively, and be, be caution here, I'm not a network guy, I'm a network person. Um, but um, exclusively on router protocols. Yep. An eventual consistent model of really smart people who created these router protocols that just eventually consistent distribute to all these control planes on all these devices. And then that becomes the brains of the data path. The, which is basically pack it in, pack it out, pack it in. What should it do? Where does it go? Ackles, whatever, right? right. And so what 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 SDN was was um, again a pragmatic definition is to say you know what we're going to do is we're going to pull out that control plane and we're going to make it centralized and we're going to make it more malleable for people to human beings to actually kind of program the logic of it, right? So it becomes a protocol like OpenFlow. You use match tables. And things like that, so you can actually manipulate the flow um, m m more in a you know like dare I say DevOps style, but but certainly uh, a, a more malleable programmatic data flow. Okay, so if I were to <clears throat> if I'm sort of boiling all this stuff down, and there's you, you did some, you've got a couple of demos, sort of pre uh, you know uh, technology preview demos. We've got the the links in the show notes. If I cool. if I kind of boil this all down, it's like you've got um, a bunch of networking technologies now, whether it's uh, open daylight, whether it's the networking stuff that's in OpenStack, whether it's in uh, OpenFlow, um, you've got you know some of the commercial things like VMware's NSX and so forth. They're all basically, they're, they were kind of built around a concept of, of VMs to a certain extent, but they're, yes. all, they're all built to basically have open vSwitch at the edge, right? That becomes the new, you know, what, what, what used to be your top of rack switch. And what you guys are doing is you're going, we're going to take all that knowledge and all that goodness that's in OVS and and within the nodes themselves um, apply that to Docker, right? Make it Docker native as close to, to the Docker containers as possible. Yeah, and yeah, and with the, and, and I was going with the micro segmentation. So this is a great question. So um, yes, and yes, and yes. So um, but if you think about it, um, I mean, a lot of people were working on these different ideas of what we now call SDN mm -hmm. at the time that the Nasir Martin Casado, who mostly for good reason gets credited as the father sure. of SDN, um, their model was to use Open vSwitch, and they did a lot of incredible things with Open vSwitch, including getting Open vSwitch into the kernel of Linux, right? That, you know, Brent Salisbury says that's the greatest thing, Martin. Out of all the great things that Martin Casado did, the great Brent says this: the greatest thing he ever did was get you know Open vSwitch in a kernel. Mm -hmm. So, but there were other vendors that were kind of toying around. Like, for example, you take a company like Nuage, and and like they didn't start out with Open vSwitch; they had their own proprietary. Plum Grid has its own proprietary. Now, the writing on the wall, like Nuage, is actually switching to Open vSwitch, right? So. Mm -hmm. Just to do a layer of clarification, and not all SDNs are on vSwitch, but but it really is becoming the most the most logical one. Right. Um, so yeah. So what what happens there is you got Open vSwitch as the new the the new edge is a host, right? An x86 host. 
you have now the the switching fabric is software. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a V, if you're a pure VMware shop, that's V, that's VSwitch, right? But mm -hmm. if you're open source, then it's probably going to be Open VSwitch. Right. But here's the thing, right? So those the videos that we've done are very interesting from an OpEx perspective. But all we've done at this point is overlays, mm -hmm. right? So we said, oh, good, you know, and 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 I think important when you talk about Docker because if so the 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 um the videos that um that uh, Brian was alluding to or where I've done some simple things where I created a LAMP stack. I got three um, Docker hosts and I'm running, um, I'm running like HA proxy on host one as a, as a, as a container. And then I've got a host two with two WordPress Docker instances. And then I got a host three with, um, with a MySQL mm -hmm. Docker instance. And, and normally to do, um, to set that up in Docker, it's kind of unnatural. You have to expose ports, right? Right, you know? right. And, and so my point is what we've done is once you implement a native open vSwitch model, and we have a clustering model, so we install an agent on each machine, then every container basically create logical networks like an SDN. Mm -hmm. I got a logical network called web. I got a logical network called – and logical network web is you know, 10.0.0.1 you know, .0 and slash 24 and, 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 and database is 10.0.0, you know, or you know, whatever, 0.1. Right. Uh, and, and slash 24. And, and so, um, and now there's no port exposing and any, you know, special like, oh it's different because it's now containers. Basically now you just install, um, HA proxy. You add the, the WordPress containers into its round robin list you in the round, uh, the, 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 um, the PHP code for the WordPress where it points to the database just points to MySQL yep. and it's as if you've got VMs. Gotcha. So we've solved that with our tech preview, which, you know, again, if you show, if hopefully you'll put in the show notes, our tech preview, um, uh, which we put out over the summer, uh, I mean, before Christmas, but here's the thing, right? So that's cool. We've integrated native open vSwitch. We can create tunnels. We can create these logical networks. But the real meat behind SDN, so the phoenix in the ashes, right, is the micro-segmentation, yep. which means that uh, we're now, and this is something Brent has already developed for Open Daylight. So, you know, we are working on this right now as kind of our next phase. Hopefully in a month or two we'll have it out, um, where we can start moving load balancing and firewalling and quality of services and just all the things that – that you know what again VMware calls micro segmentation. That now you can move like logical service chaining or service type things into the programmable data path through yeah. some policy. So now you can have not only can I create these like think of the scenario where I have three doc, Docker hosts, three physical hosts, mm -hmm. and I run I run a couple of containers. I run two containers on host one for service called you know uh, blah. And then I run like one, one container on host two that's also a part of the logical network flaw. And then I've got three on host three that are all in. So these are all basically in a, kind of an SDN overlay. They're all treated as a service. That's my overlay pattern. And I can have blah two with a mixture of containers spread across those three. But the important point is not only are each one of those segment, segmented by their own logical network, I could now start injecting service chains like I could put a load balancer, um, logical load balancer, by manipulating the data path on those three hosts via open vSwitch load tables. Yep. Or I could put denial of services or I can, I can put QoS. Or, and the one that really gets me going is I can actually use those load tables to give distinct telemetry and for those of you DevOps laymans, um, that's monitoring for you. Um, um, to, you know, um, and th that I can now tell you really detailed information about your services, right? Does that, yep. does that all make sense? Or? Yeah, no, it, it makes total sense because it, it was – so there was a couple of things that sort of jumped out at me having been a, an, an old-timey network person watching your stuff. The, the first one was um, – because I've watched all of the – quote unquote, traditional network folks start to talk about SDN. And it's a very network centric conversation. It's let's talk about ports and VLANs and flows and, and so forth, which is very native to networking people. And I was watching your tech previews and I was like, this, this looks and feels and the tooling that's around it. It's very 
DevOps centric, right? So what I mean by that, and I don't mean that in a way that is, um, it, it was this moment for me where I went, this, this is really that blurry time when you go, the, the problem people have is, okay, you're, you're now dealing with, um, you know, it used to be VMs. Now you're dealing with containers. Okay, fine. Um, you're going to have, you've got this malleable sort of fabric. I want to put, like you said, I want to put a, a load balancer anywhere I want to put it. I want to put a firewall where I want to put it. Um, but you don't want to do it in that sort of manual way that network people are used to. You want to, you want to go, I want it to be consistent. I want it to be able to integrate with stuff. And it's like, the only way you're going to make that happen is sort of where you guys are showing this, right? It's got to be integrated with Vagrant. It's got to be integrated where I'm going to pull the most, you know, up-to-date version off of GitHub. It's going to, you know, sort of natively integrate with OVS. And it was this interesting sort of, I went, okay, this is the first time I've seen it really blurred together. It's not this very distinct server guys and network guys. So th that piece was really interesting to me. And then the other question I sort of was logically had in my head is I was like, where do they, how are they going to do these sort of layer four through seven services, right? Is it, you know, do you just treat them like servers and appliances and you can put them anywhere, but I wasn't quite sure where you were going. So it was good to see that you can take advantage of that service chaining, that, that logic that's come from an open daylight or from anywhere and apply it to this model. Yeah. I mean, that's to me, you know, I mean, there's a couple of things here, right? So, um, you know, that's our, you know, there I say it's secret weapon, right? So mm -hmm. if, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people doing Docker networking right now, right? Like, yep. yeah, I mean, I, I think they average one a day, <laughs> um, but, but that's great. Right? I mean, the ecosystem is awesome. I mean, there's a billion orchestration guys. There's a billion, you know, um, but like, again, our secret weapon is we're going down a path where we know here's the beauty of what we've done. Right. And it's going to sound like I'm patting myself on the back here, but like Brent, Dave and Madhu. So Madhu wrote, a6, he basically was an A6 program for Cisco, right? Mm -hmm. like, like on the Cat 6K, right? Like, you know, the, yeah. the thing that runs the hardcore framework, stuff, yeah. Right, right. And then he switches off to build this thing called Open Daylight and is the first committer of Open Daylight, right? And then spends a couple of years. So, like, and, and, and people who, if you don't know Brent, go to his blog and you'll see he's a pipe hitting network dude, right? Um, and, and Dave's very, very much the same background. And then you add me in with all my DevOps and Chef and all that. Like that, I think that's – I didn't even realize I had conveyed that message. I mean I think in the back of my mind I wanted that message to come out when, when I was doing those videos. Mm -hmm. but, but, but that's – I mean we knew this mixture of the four of us was going to create that kind of chemistry. And so, so I'm, I'm really uh, flattered that you actually caught something that I, I, I think initially we, we set out as a goal – we thought, oh my God, if the four of us could do this, the mixture is going to be amazing. But I didn't know how we how that was going to manifest or people see it. But the second important point you kind of touched on a little bit is um, if if you know when we start talking about a programmable data flow or moving those things like load balances and firewalls and stuff into the programmable data flow, this becomes really important. When we start thinking about what can happen with containers. Yep. Right. Because so and, and there's two variables here. Right. There's the variable that is the obvious one, which is the scale. Like so a host today, that's a v, VM with um, a host, a, a hypervisor based host of VMs might be 40. I've heard much higher, crazy over provision numbers. Let's be uh, let's just say 100. Yep. Right. To be safe. Well, I will guarantee you that containers at scale will be at least an order of magnitude, maybe two, right? right? And now think about like how many HA proxies, and then say I've got now a thousand, uh, a, a thousand hosts with, um, I don't know, 5,000 containers each, and how many HA proxies for these services? Okay, and what's the tromboning effect of you know leaving the data path to do that, plus the firewall? Are, they, are you gonna have Linux bridge, IP tables, and HA proxies? spread all over that or can you move maybe not all of it but but a fair amount of that into the data path and well, imagine the opex well imagine the two the tail of two opexes right you know well it, and it and it becomes kind of an interesting thing because you <clears throat> so one one of the things that used to be the, the way we we did networks was there was very structural hierarchies and there were certain places where you put sort of four through seven services right so security would kind of be at the edge you know, uh, HA would be in certain places and so forth. 
and and now that you have these very different traffic flows you've got mm -hmm. you know instead of north and south you've got east and west you've got you've got to deal with mobile stuff you you don't really know where your parameters are that that sort of what is the hierarchy of the network looks like becomes mm, i don't know it depends what we're doing right if you're a company that's going to you know your your interaction with the marketplace is around you know, mobile, it could be radically different than if you're just doing like, you know, internal data centers and collaboration apps and whatever it is. And, I, you know, I think you're hitting on something that, you know, I would, you know, you guys ought to play off of as well. You know, you hear companies like Illumio talking about, you know, the security parameters are all changing. You've got to be able to, as the network team, be able to go, I can put any service anywhere, you know, as, as, and, it, and oh, by the way, as things change and we get that telemetry and we figure out that the patterns are different, I need to be able to move them around as well. You know, you, so, give, you give me chills right now. Because, <laughs> honestly, because I said there were two variables and the second variable is kind to live, right? Yep. The, 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 and the how quick do, you know, I think the, the world of microservices and people thinking about, you know, again, the play buzzword bingo data gravity, where we might actually be running bursts of a compute for very short periods of time. I burst a thousand here. I burst a thousand here. Follow the data, basically, right? Yeah. Um, so those are my two variables. But yeah, you've brought a whole other variable, which is, um, is the that this is, it's obvious. I mean, I, I Brent clued me into a report the other day where it was, and it was it was something that Facebook did a while back. But you know, you could say that like in 1990, maybe 80, 90 percent of the traffic was north south, and you know, 10 or you know, probably 10 or 15 percent. Uh, east west right and then we got to 2012 with large web scale infrastructures is probably 75 east west um 25 north south right? right and and this this facebook report that came out a couple of months ago um says that like if you if you read their charts it's 90 it's like 98% it's 95 or 98% east west mm -hmm. so you're you're spot on it is now about um traffic patterns completely changing so where i put a load balancer like, you know, I probably want them spread across the cluster of a host. But the other thing where I think I really got the chills where you're talking about is, you know, I, I talk about the time to live be, be, being a new dynamic factor. Mm -hmm. Like, again, if, if I'm going to have, I, I said, I did a, a podcast with somebody last, uh, early this week, and I, I said, let's just assume that in a large scale data center, I, 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 there's a guy I, that I know that I actually want to get some good numbers, but let's say that just to make up a number today, um, in a in a given week, you start or stop a thousand VMs. Yep. Right. Well, we've already heard the mythical uh, Google two point two billion dollar a uh, billion billion containers per week. Yep. I mean, so I could easily see a world where a shop that was doing starting and stopping a thousand VMs in a week might be a billion in one week. And then think about the opex of creating a Linux bridge and an IP, to, you know, th all the things that have to happen for the breakdown and breakup of that, right? Right. Um, so, so, so again, the, the TTL is huge, but you've indicated another variable, which is the variability of movement, right? Like I need to be able to, if flows are like 98% or 90% east-west, they might be 90% now and 98% here. I need to adjust dynamically. Yep. And, and, and the programmable data play, play is, you know, again, it's it's kind of a V motion for services. You know, or if somebody could run, reach in and punch me in the face for saying that, but uh, right now, but but it becomes this. Uh, it's a V motion for the service stack itself. Right. Well, and and I think a lot of it is, you know, and and, and this was the piece that was really interesting to me is, um, and and, and this is the part that's weird. So when back in the day when you would have networking conversations and this is still going on so the you know the VMware and, and Cisco guys debate this all the time it's all like network architecture network architecture who does it better who scales and so forth and and what sort of dawned on me when I was looking at your guys stuff is I was like this if we really get into the sort of software defined of things you almost have to treat everything like a server and you want every you'd really like all that network stuff to sort of be irrelevant right it's got to have a name it's got to have a certain addressing to it and you know maybe certain ports open up automatically so that, because you're logically but it, it it it's becoming this i i think about it and describe it the way that application people do or server people do and so it becomes less about the network architecture of the the boxes doing or the software doing networking and becomes you better be really good at at those fast tools 
right? And you better be really good at at having that knowledge to go. How do I tie into those to those things, right? It's um, you know, and, and you hear folks talking about like, well, is this a just another Docker wrapper, or wrap or something around Docker or whatever? Like your your thing has that that foundation to be able to like, I can go really fast, right? So for those people that go, the reason I'm going to Docker is I've got short lived stuff or I've got lightweight stuff or I'm gonna, you know, build my, you guys fit right into that space as opposed to kind of this weird, am I selling to developers or selling to network mm -hmm. people yeah, who are yeah. very, you know, you know, other ends of the spectrum and stuff. So yeah. that part's really interesting. So real quick, I'm gonna ask one last question because I know we're all sort of time frame bound and I w I'd love to have you guys come back at some point we can talk about architecture and we'll get Brent and the other guys and yeah um, people you know the, the docker ecosystem is is crazy you talked about there's you know new companies popping up all over the time and one of the things I hear from folks now is they're saying like well there's this weird thing happening with docker where people are building these sort of like wrapping around docker or wrappers around what does that mean mm -hmm. um, and, and what does that mean like for the ecosystem well, um, it, it, there's good news here, right? Like, so I think um, I, I, I spent, you know, early on when Docker was just getting started, I actually had the opportunity to be the first evangelist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 you know, it's a, uh, th these are good problems to have, but while we were discussing, so literally they were just, I mean, Ben Gullib was just coming on board. I mean, I was talking to Solomon and my CEO in Stratus calls and says, hey, hey guys, we need to get on a con call. Gets on the con call and he's like, Guys, it looks like Dell's going to acquire us. Yep. I'm, like, I'm like, oh, shit. You know, yeah, and you say, sense. oh, shit, like I'm going to make a bunch of money, but like I really wanted to do this Docker thing. So I called those guys and I said, you know, I, I can't do this. But I spent a lot of time early on with, with Solomon talking about the business model and, and all this stuff, right? Because you know, I really thought I was going to join them. And and then I, I kind of went away for a while. I did, you know, I, 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 um, I did a bunch of other stuff. I focused actually on things like NSX and Nuage and working with some large companies trying to figure that stuff out and then i came back and then i've gotten to, to see the, the consistency of solomon right like so i'm a fanboy right because because uh -huh. his model has always been he has this kind of um duality if you will and now it's where he might get mad at me but um one where one is he knows he's built something that is awesome for the first time developers get right to compute Mm -hmm. I would say developers never ask for OpenStack. They don't ask for, you know, um, Zen versus KVM versus, I mean, you know, maybe if they're, they're building their own kind of lab stuff, but, but like develop, uh, developers don't ask, right? They just go to Docker, right? So he's created this, this magic shrinking of people who need compute resources to getting them as fast as possible with no friction. Now, in order to do that, you have to do what they call batteries included. Right, you have to kind of. That's why the networking is not that great. That's why the original orchestration is not that great. Uh -huh. Okay, now the ecosystem grows around them, and how do you do batteries included, but you also want to have best of breed integration? So they've really, they, you know, I, I'm not a storage guy. I know you are, Aaron, but like, so it sounds like their first challenge was they did this kind of plug-in architecture stuff. You know, they had to do it with some of the things like. Uh, you know, like Swift and, and Ceph and all the whatever object stores and different type of storage implementations. Um, and they, they started down this path of like there's a batteries included and then there's this kind of plug-in architecture. And, and they changed the name of what, whether it's a plug-in or it's called a power strip or it's called a whatever. Mm -hmm. that, that has changed here. And, and that's not a criticism. Um, so we have been getting involved with this discussion we were really kind of the first ones to really drive this um, this discussion about batteries included in the networking versus alternatives to batteries included. And so if you want to read this, I think the Madhu says it's the second most commented uh, pull request on Docker is our um, net multi-network, multi-host networking solution. Oh, right. You guys made a sort of a proposal it, for how to do it. Yeah. yeah. It, the video says, I think he said, is he the second or thir third most commented on all Docker um, pull requests, right? Like, imagine that, right? Yeah. And, and that was the can over. It caused, you know, people were screaming and, you know, oh, my God, how could you let these guys own networking for, you know, it was people accused us of, I think people were saying I killed kittens. I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> 
but 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 the but the thing was we can open this whole discussion which now is manifesting of how to how does docker provide a batteries included and they're about you know that they've been working on this you know actually ever since that proposal um and and be able to deliver this kind of overlay vxlan stuff which you get out of the box but how do you actually let somebody like us integrate open vswitch so so the answer is um, they're working really hard, and I think a good example is Swarm versus Mesos, mm -hmm. right? Like it, uh, Solomon got up on stage at DockerCon EU. I happened to be there, and he announced Swarm, and then he said, "Oh, by the way, Swarm works really good, but if you want to see the kind of industrial strength one," and then the, one of the founders of Mesos got up on stage and talked about Swarm and um, Swarm and Mesos integration and how they kind of plug in with each other, right? right. So I, I think. You know, so some people look at Docker as like they're trying to take over the world, they're trying to do this, you know, they're they're not being friendly with some vendors. I think the bottom line is there's a duality there where uh, Solomon, and I say Solomon, but the whole team wants to basically viciously uh, protect the thing that they know has made them so successful, which is, zero, you know, minimal friction between people who need re resources, primarily compute, and the delivery of those resources, yep. along with the ability to put best of breed in place in the right way that doesn't compromise on each side. So it's duality, and they've done the best possible job of batteries included in this, and and within the constraints yep. of this being one of the fastest growing projects I've ever seen. This is this is the the next great sort of education opportunity for everybody is how far batteries included do you go versus modularity, and there's pros and cons to both, and and uh, and. The, the cool thing is it's moving super fast and, and people are iterating on stuff. So, so folks, that's going to wrap it up for today's show. Uh, thank you so much to John Willis from Socket Plane and for Aaron. Um, I think it was a great conversation. I think we're going we're gonna to end up uh, having to do a bunch more around this space, this blurring between uh, SDN and networking server space and and devops and so forth so uh great conversation folks as always if you like the show tell a friend uh leave us a review on itunes you can find us on the uh on the twitters at the cloudcast net or on the web at the cloudcast.net so for john and for aaron uh thanks have a great day and uh, have a great weekend Bye. Leave a review on iTunes and tell a friend about the podcast.